Hello, everyone. My name is Aisha Ghazi, and I am a member of the Engage team. We'd like to welcome you here all today Shoot. to our panel on the intersection of disability, racism, and police violence. Before we start, I would like um, to feature Nishorn Price, who is going to say a few words and introduce herself about our talk today. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. If you need subtitles, please click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. You can also make the font bigger or smaller as you like. Once again, we welcome you to the engaged session on the intersection of disability, race, and police violence. My name is Nisharan Price, as um, mentioned, and I use the pronouns she and her. I am a student service specialist here in the school and a member of the Michigan Social Work Inclusion and Access Task Force. I've been asked on I've been asked on behalf of Engage to introduce our presenters due to my work on disability justice and conclusion inclusion in the school. I would like to introduce members of the Engage team, Dr. Trina Shanks, director of community engagement, who will be joining us shortly, Aisha Gaza, Engage Program Coordinator, Jamie Simmons, our field intern, Fatima Solomon, our Solomon, sorry, and Sonia Harb. The Engage team is bringing this session because it's critical to social work practice to actively dismantle ableism in all ways and all that we do and that we learn how to ground our movement in social justice in disability justice and inclusion a few words from my point of view is social justice and disability is a very critical issue of exclusion due to the systematic oppression that leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's appearance and or their ability to satisfactory, satisfactorily excel and behave, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Disability justice puts the issue of people left out of the disability rights movement at the center. In my view, the intersection between race and people who experience disabilities needs a thorough examination. More black people experience disability-based discrimination based on the complex factors such as in inadequate access to health care, institutional racism, environmental just injustice, etc. This is why there is a need to address the disconnect of race, disability, and systematic inclusion. Our exclusion, excuse me. Before we move forward, I'd like to thank our ASL, American Sign Language Interpreters, for support with access and language justice. This makes our session more accessible and beneficial to everyone. Live caption of this is being done. Please make sure you um, use the chat if there's a question, um, as well as if you need any support. Um, I would like to hand this over to Aisha, on en our Engage um, team member to introduce our presenters. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Aisha Ghazi. I use the pronoun she, hers. Um, I'd like to thank you, Nice Sean, for those words and for all the work that you do in the school. Um, I am a program coordinator of the Engaged team, and I also work for the organization Detroit Disability Power, which is how I was introduced to some of our guests today. It's now my honor to introduce our guests who are internationally renowned disability justice scholars and activists, including Talila T.L. Lewis, attorney, educator, and organizer, Dustin D.G. Gibson, community builder and abolitionist, and Teddy Dorsett III, communications manager and organizer of Detroit Disability Power. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a local disability activist on with us, Baba Baxter Jones, who will be sharing his story later today during the call and his experience 
with experiencing ableist police violence as a person with a disability. For now, I'd like to give all of our guests the chance to introduce themselves. So TL, Dustin, and Teddy, please take a few minutes and share your preferred pronouns, your work, and your role in the disability justice movement. This is TL, I can begin. Um, my name is Talila Lewis. My sign name and name generally is just TL. I don't use any gender pronouns. I prefer that people just say my name, Lewis, Talila, or TL. Uh, they or them is fine as well. Um, my work really uh, is at the intersections of racism, classism, and ableism, among other systemic oppressions and helping folks understand the connections between ableism specifically and all forms of uh, systemic and structural inequity and injustice. I do a lot of work um, in carceral spaces, which is a broad word that encompasses jails, prisons, uh, psych facilities, nursing facilities, group facilities, also known as group homes, but we call them facilities, um, and other spaces where people are um, placed, um, held, and uh, where their bodies make money for either the government or uh, private business, um, private businesses. So um, I'll talk a little bit more later, but I think, and then um, just my, my description, um, I'm a black person with a medium dark skin tone. I'm wearing a black um, cardigan over a light blue shirt. I have a hat on and um, circle rimmed glasses and I'm seated in front of a, a bookshelf with a lot of books and some photos. I'll pass it to Dustin Gibson. What's up everybody? This is, uh, my name is Dustin Gibson. I use he and him pronouns. Um, I have, uh, I'm a light skinned black person with a beard. I have a cap on um, with headphones in the background. I have um, trees in a backyard. I have a white t-shirt on. Um, with the words free Josh Williams across my chest. Uh, Josh is uh, uh, the only remaining political prisoner from the Ferguson uprisings of 2014. Um, he was imprisoned at age uh, 19, just turned 24 um, last November, um, and is still serving an unjust sentence um, for his participation in educating the world and bringing light to um, how some of uh, the racist and ableist police violence impacts all of us. Um, my work is uh, uh, rooted in deinstitutionalization. Um, so broadly speaking, as TL said, uh, uh, getting folks free and supporting the, uh, the freedom journeys of people leaving nursing facilities, prisons, jails, um, kid jails as well. Um, and once they're back in the community, um, supporting and building informal peer support networks um, that we can use to, to, to build power amongst us to uh, uh, either resist uh, state violence um, or to live and thrive um, as we need to. Um, and also, uh, I do a lot of uh, coalitional work. Um, so cross movement building and incorporating disability justice practices and principles into um, the work that um, we are all a part of in, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, and I will pass to Teddy. Hi everyone, my name is Teddy Dorset. Teddy Dorset III, and my pronouns are he and him. I am a standing in front of a black background. I'm a dark skinned gentleman. I'm wearing black glasses and I have my dreads pulled up into a high bun. I'm also wearing a striped shirt that consists of white, pink, and black stripes. I work with the Detroit Power uh, group that, as well as uh, Ayesha, that same group I'm involved in as well. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I am from a deaf family. I am deaf myself as well. And my work is really focusing on educating folks on the deaf, the deaf, the deaf, blind and hard of hearing community, 
what that looks like, what our lives looks like. And I really focus on um, really going up against the systems that try to deconstruct the racism that we see within our institutions and just working on how we abolish, again, those racist institutions that continue to perpetualize racism, classism, and I'm an advocate in that way. I do have uh, a background in these areas and I use that background to support my work in the abolition and, and bringing light to some of the issues that the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing communities suffer as it relates to police brutality and the like. We talk about the institutions, their policies. I go and educate them on how they can improve their policies and, and you know, change the way that they do things, the ways that they continue to perpetuate oppression. I collaborate with a lot of organizations within the area uh, whether that relates to political policy changes, uh, working in the local community as well. I also have a background in uh, teaching folks what it means to be a part of uh, the deaf and deafblind communities. So that education on, on um, what that culture and community looks like. Really, my main focus is abolishing oppressive systems and giving folks in our communities the justice that they deserve and need. Hello everyone, this is Aisha. Thank you to all of our guests. Um, it is an honor for all of you guys to be joining us today. Before we move forward, I wanna mention a few things. In order to see the ASL interpreter on the screen in addition to the guest who is sharing, please click the gallery view in the upper right-hand corner. In order to see live subtitles for this session, please click the live transcript button in the bottom right-hand corner and toggle to show subtitles. You can also then adjust the size of the text and the font. Um, to describe my image, I am an Asian American Indian woman I am sitting at a desk wearing a maroon shirt. So I would now like to turn it over to TL and Dustin, who are going to help ground the conversation for us. So Fatima, if you could please go to the next slide. So this is Dustin, um, and on the screen, um, it says grounding the conversation and centering people. Um, this is a practice that we want to do to remind ourselves um, and then invite other people into why conversations like this and the work that um, all of us are doing is, is so critical. Um, and also uh, speaking the names of people that um, are now ancestors and guiding us. So on the left side of the screen, um, there's an image of a woman um, in a graduation attire um, with uh, long black hair and a, a, a vibrant smi smile. Um, that's Natasha McKenna. Um, she was born in the year 1978 um, and was murdered in 2015. I think in this time right now where there's uh, a, a lot of uh, viral sensations or videos of people like Amy Cooper in New York calling the police on somebody bird watching um, or barbecue Becky um, out in California calling the police. Um, uh, many of us know that, that uh, there's a long history and lineage to that type of activity and how um, white people in particular have wielded state power in order to um, remove uh, black people and black disabled people in general from public. Um, Natasha McCourt, uh, McKenna's story, or at least the small sliver of her story is not um, different from those instances. Um, someone uh, called the police on her at a real estate company um, that ultimately led her to going to um, not just the jail, but being uh, involuntary committed um, into a psych ward and then released. And that kind of uh, snowballed into her being in a jail in uh, Fairfax County in Virginia. Um, while she was in the jail, uh, uh, the cops were aware that she had diagnosis of um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, 
there's a, a 45 minute uh, long video online of her uh, torture and her murder where um, she is naked, shackled uh, legs and uh, hands with cops in hazmat suits, um, tasering her and attempting to put her on a gurney. Um, and her literal last words are, you promised you wouldn't kill me. Um, what this does is, uh, it, it's, it's one example of how uh, police violence is not only happening like within communities, but it's also a part of a larger prison industrial complex. Which, uh, hopefully we'll have time to kind of uh, talk a bit more about. Um, in the middle of the screen, um, there's an image of a young Bruce Kelly Jr., um, a black man with a black shirt on. Um, Bruce is uh, somebody that was diagnosed with schizophrenia, other psychiatric disabilities. Um, he was houseless at the time of his murder. Um, it happened right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in a borough called Wilkinsburg. Wilkinsburg, a borough in which just murdered um, Romir Talley. That's R O M I R T A L L E Y um, in December. But Bruce is somebody that was very much a part of the neighborhood. Um, he was a part of the neighborhood in which I worked in and, and occupied. Um, he was in the park with his father when cops came up to him. Um, they were aware of his disabilities. He walked away for 20 minutes, um, followed by 10 to 12 officers. Um, they murdered Bruce in the street after they released the dog on him. Um, and Bruce defended himself against the dog. Um, the, the kill shot was in the back of his head. They left him on the sidewalk for about eight hours. We had to divert children getting off the school buses away from seeing his body, which they left uncovered as well. Um, so what happened to Bruce is also another example of uh, uh, the need for a different response when these types of situations happen. Typically we say, hey, we need to train the police to be aware of people with disabilities. Um, and what we know now is if we go back and look at all of the people that we know of that have been murdered by police with disabilities, um, the police have had that training before, right? They know of the disabilities and that hasn't, um, actually prevented that. So um, our goal is to abolish um, the police because we know that that interaction can, could never lead to uh, anything uh, good or fruitful. And I'll pass the TL um, to talk about juniors. This is TL um, having a rough day. Um, so I, I guess I want to share the sign name for Junius, which is a J in the middle of the chest is his sign name. Junius Wilson was black, deaf and disabled and um, was arrested uh, as a young child, um, teenager in the late teens, 19 teens um, for allegedly, you know, something involving a white woman uh, that didn't happen. Um, he was separated from his school. He went to segregated black deaf schools. Uh, was, uh, so use Raleigh Sign Language, which is a, a language unique and unto black deaf folks who uh, were born and raised in Raleigh or lived in Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, was you know rounded up by the police. Uh, finger spelling white. Coda, police officer, child of, a, of deaf adults who was white, tried to fingerspell with him during a police interrogation. Um, Junius didn't understand that person and that person didn't understand Junius. He, Junius was then labeled um, as having uh, intellectual di disabilities and uh, then put into a, a psych institution, uh, institutions that uh, house people who allegedly had disabilities. What we know about um, all of these institutions, both past and present, is that um, the United States has always utilized labels of disability, of race and class to criminalize black and or disabled people. Um, and Junius Wilson ended up spending over 70 years incarcerated in psych facilities uh, he uh, was castrated and a number of other medical experimentations done upon him. Um, he was not alone. There were other black, deaf, disabled people in those spaces, uh, low income as well, um, who had these same tortures done to them. 
And all the while, um, in all of those spaces that he was in, he was doing free labor. Um, and so I talked to folks a lot about the connections between plantations, prisons, zoos, asylums, um, and poor houses or shelters as we call them nowadays, and how inherently connected all of these systems are. And Junius Wilson is a, um, a, a living testament and now an ancestor but it was a testament to how these systems uh, work together uh, to criminalize um, and to punish uh, Black disabled folks for simply existing. And so I just want to like take a moment to honor all of them and others who maybe haven't been named as we try to ground ourselves in understanding that what we're talking about are not numbers or statistics. Um, and, and Baba Baxter, who's on the phone, is another living person who is um, affected at this moment, all of us are affected at this moment by these systems. Um, and so I just wanna take a moment to just kind of think about um, some of these names, maybe sign the name of Junius and others who you might know. This is Aisha. Um, I wanna thank you TL and Dustin for sharing all of that. They're tragic cases and they're not just cases, it's the reality that we need to reckon with. I want us to take a one minute break to regroup and for the interpreters to have a moment, as well as us to, just have to think about how this impacts various areas of our lives. This is Aisha. So I'd like to start by asking um, our panelists some questions. TL, you shared a little bit about, you know, the prison industrial complex and how these systems profit off of bodies. I'm wondering if you guys can all share your view on how you feel capitalism is connected to ableism and to police brutality. So this is Dustin. Um, yeah, I can briefly talk a bit about that. So uh, reviewing ableism is not something that is merely the discrimination against people with disabilities, right? Um, and I'm going to be using uh, uh, identity first language because I'm uh, identifying myself as somebody that uh, is politically and socially disabled. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to go into that, but just for clarification, when um, myself and others might be using that language that you know that it's rooted in a political ideology and a designation. Um, but ableism within and of itself is not only uh, the discrimination or the oppression of people with disabilities, it's a larger system that is constructed um, through anti-Blackness. So uh, as racism is, um, has different forms, one being anti-Black racism, ableism um, does not, because ableism within in and of itself is an anti-Black project. Um, we're also incorporating eugenics and colonialism and capitalism into that. Um, capitalism, one of the, uh, uh, the reasons that it's a part of what ableism is is because we have a system that is built on production and how much um, humans can produce and our value is intrinsically tied to what we can produce. Um, so even when we're thinking about um, how labor is constructed in the US right now, um, in the amount of hours that uh, we're called upon to work in order to survive and meet our basic needs, um, many of those uh, systems or industries conflict with what we actually need to be whole and people. Um, so when we're talking about rest, something that has not been afforded to um, Black Indigenous people um, in this country um, ever um, is one of the things that creates and manufactures disability, right? Um, we can capitalism, like the, the way in which we protect our, our capitalist interest, interest is um, through force and violence, um, state violence in, in particular. Um, so that draws in this imperialism factor of um, what it looks like to be able to protect the interest of a nation state um, and how the U.S. has intervened um, and caused destruction around the world. If we're thinking about U.S.'s support for Israel and the occupation of Palestine, um, if we're thinking about the interventions in Venezuela or even at the, uh, the, the support for the Brazil regime right now. Um, all of those are ways in which disability is created through war. Um, the, the ways in which we need free um, housing, free healthcare, 
um, and it's afforded through military, right? And thinking about who we recruit into military services, usually poor people, usually black people, usually people from the South and rural areas. Um, so I just want to like lay that out and I feel like that's like very broad um, and hopefully TL and um, Teddy can add to some of that. So with disability justice, what does that exactly mean? What do we have to do and how do we have to educate that? So educating broadly people, we have to take action, taking action through protests, just as Dustin mentioned, protests, and also speaking out and educating the community, saying what's not right and what we have to do and to provide time uh, many years of people who have marginalized, just put it under the rug, how we have no issues. This is the time that we need to start to recognize what we have to do and what those issues are and how we can change it. And we talk about disability justice. We have to think about how it impacts us. What can we do? How can we change that? How can we change the system or abolish it? A lot of times police brutality happens. And the reason is that not just only because individuals are anti-blackness, but we have to understand what the response is and how police should, hmm, how do I say this? should not take away money from the government, should not use that money from the government. So we need to improve, improve our systems and that funding should go into investing to, into communities, to education, to providing more resources for the community, providing more support so that we can go ahead and change our perspective of how police should interact with the community. It's not just that, but we can't separate the two and two different issues with racism and police violence, they coincide together. And so during time for me as a deaf individual, I have to recognize my disability, but at the same time, I have to remind myself that I am also black. So at the same time, there's a lot of fear that I have, a lot of doubt in my alone path of feeling concerns about communication. How do I communicate to the officers who approach me and I said, hey, I need an interpreter. Hey, I, can we write back and forth? Can they understand what I'm saying? Can I understand them? There's different fears that I have walking around. And if something is wrong, or if I move wrong, or I do something wrong, immediately they will react. Instead of thinking and taking a moment, hey, maybe this person has a disability. Maybe this is not the time to do that. Because they're already trained to re react and react to fear. And they're trained for us we have to recognize that when we're out, that's the biggest issue. So how do I make sure, how do we make sure to change that approach when police officers approach us? This is TL. I really appreciate Teddy bringing up um, budgets, um, police budgets, because there are some um, places where over 50% of our entire budget goes to violent policing systems. And we have to also look at the military industrial complex, which is completely tied to the carceral complex, um, which actually just makes me think about um, the fact that many of our ancestors were invited to send themselves to prison or to send themselves to war um, as some sort of ultimatum as to where their bodies should be made of value to our government. Right. These are real things that happened here in the United States and, and to a degree are still happening, uh, maybe not necessarily in that precise way. Um, when you look at enslavement um, and indigenous genocides, all of those were done quite literally for capital, capital of all types, right? Whether we're talking about um, financial, economic, social, political, our laws were quite literally created to maintain and create um, these um, um, 
what's the word in English? Ideas of importance of people and um, property based on white supremacist uh, ableist ideas, um, ideas about whose bodies and minds uh, were valuable, or again, are based on ableist white supremacist ideas. Understand that within white supremacy, people often talk about white supremacist heteropatriarchy. Um, within that, you have to understand ableism is at its heart, as is capitalism. Um, you can't talk about imperialism, colonialism without including capital. Um, our bodies, um, bodies that are otherwise deemed uh, undesirable, whether that be because they're black, because they look different, because they're indigenous, um, because they're taking up space that white uh, or wealth, wealthy and power elites want. Um, there are many reasons that have been created to quite literally um, steal people from spaces, to steal property from people, uh, to put people into places where they can be disappeared. And in all of those places where those people can be disappeared um, or experimented upon or exploited for their labor uh, of all types, whether that be productivity in terms of labor or productivity in terms of reproduction of uh, more labor, um, i.e. humans, other humans, um, capital is intrinsically tied to all of these systems. And I have to name before I pass it back over that um, we, because we're talking to the School of Social Work, often there's been a recent call for like, oh, let's less money uh, in investing in policing systems and more social workers. But we have to name that our social work, our uh, medical, um, and a lot of these other helping professions are steeped in ableist, anti-Blackness, capitalism as well. And if we are just trading one system for the other, we will find ourselves in the same situation in another 20 years with social workers becoming the people who enslave um, and exploit and experiment upon our bodies and minds instead of people who are formerly known as police officers. So I really think that's really important to name and uplift in this space. So we don't think that the solution to violent policing is violent social work systems, violent medical systems, violent other systems. And, and this is Dustin. I just wanted to add a bit to what T.O. just uh, talked about is when we're talking about um, the policing apparatus that we now have, um, it is not solely the police in the departments as we traditionally know them, right? We know that police is embedded into um, almost all fabrics of our institutions, whether it be um, hospitals um, and uh, people uh, having well wellness checks called for them or them calling themselves for help um, in a police response to that. Um, the system of mandated reporting in general, I would point folks to the work of Dorothy Roberts with this. Uh, Dorothy Roberts has done a lot with the child welfare system, which she refers to as, um, I believe, the family control system. Um, and mandated reporting in schools and, and also the officers, whether they're in schools or not, teachers are still mandated reporters. Um, and also to think about uh, 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 communities, especially in disabled communities, we know the long um, uh, history of harms that have been inflicted upon us by the medical industrial complex. Um, so that replacement of police with social workers or even viewing ableism or racism as a public health crisis um, uh, implies somehow that the medical system has treated us better than the policing system, right? Um, if, if we're talking in terms of treatment, uh, we have to like bring into the fact that oftentimes during slavery, treatment is conflated with punishment. So when people are having the urge to run away from plantations, um, which was deemed a, a disability or a mental illness, streptomania, um, their, their treatment for that was hard work, sunlight and labor um, and a bath. And we see this across a lot of the disabilities that were pathologized during that period um, and then we also see it today. There's places like um, the JRC, which is in Cannon, Massachusetts, where New York sends students to this institution because they're not providing an adequate and appropriate education for them. Um, and this institution is using electroshock therapy is what they call it. 
um, but it's essentially torture devices to discipline and force people into a specific type of behavior. Um, so I do appreciate CL lifting all of the ways that the cops live around us that are not police, um, and then also the cops within ourselves, um, the way that we respond to issues, right? If we're thinking about solutions to police violence, we have to be a part of that in an interdependent way, um, and that requires us to not respond in the same way that police respond, right? Because um, quite frankly, it's not just the police that don't want disabled people in public and on streets and Black folks as well. It's our own communities that don't want um, people like Bruce Kelly to occupy space. I would like to thank you all for answering that question. Um, I want to pause for a one minute break to give the interpreters a chance to regroup and then we will move on. We're ready. Hello, everyone. This is Aisha again. Um, so our next question is, how do we ground our movements for social justice, including the movement for Black Lives Matter and disability justice? I'll, I'll take a shot. For me, I feel that historically being Black and protesting, when we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, that really shook up our, our landscape. It woke people up and it, it really made people realize that something needs to be done. It really called for the end of injustice, whether that be in policing, when we look at our public health system, our education system, all of these different systems and institutions, we, they need to be dismantled and reconfigured. One example of how that process starts when we look at movements, um, I think it's one of, the, one of the parts of the process when it comes to making a difference. And that's just one of the steps in, in having movements and really waking people up. For me as a Black Deaf person, I know that when I saw the Black Lives Matter movement, I wanted to be a part of, of those protests. However, at the same time, as a Deaf person, it was difficult for me to participate. When we look at disability justice, it recognizing who is involved on the other side as far as the protesters and the participants and how they're able to to participate and we look at our policies, who do those policies affect? Who are leading the protests? Who are able to be a part of protests and other movements? Who has a voice, you know, who was included and recognized in these movements? And so it was really important for, uh, you know, people to really recognize what, what disability is, what it looks like and how our systems are allowing it to be perpetuate, uh, to perpetuate the exclusion of that group of those groups. We really have to educate the public and society on uh, people who are involved in the space of trying to, you know, do, do better and being proactive, having the motivation and, and getting the information out there on what the, disabil uh, the communities with disabilities, what they need, what their lives look like. I know in Texas, there were a lot of protests that occurred and a lot of um, centered on fighting police brutality within our communities. And to be involved is a challenge for those, uh, for the simple fact of COVID, and then to have a disability that's an additional barrier for us. 
So figuring out how we can use ourselves to be a part of that change and a part of that movement is it, it, tough to, to have, to be safe at those movements, to have access to what's being spoken and, and, and whatnot. Uh, those space, we need to make sure that there is justice included in them, that we have disability justice, language justice, and that we have a educated community that is recognizing you know, what the space looks like currently and what it needs to look like to accommodate all of those who need to be involved in the conversation. How people are able to access things, how they're able to show up and what, uh, I think all of those things need to be considered when we look at who we're including in our disability justice and grounding our movements in that. This is TL, I completely agree. Um, with what you just said, I think it's important also to name um, the origin of the disconnect between uh, negatively racialized communities being able to safely um, and proudly identify as disabled. Um, since time of memoriam, white folks in the United States, uh, white wealth privileged people um, have um, controlled the narrative around what disability is and what it is not, around um, who has disability and who does not, around what might lead to disability and what might not. That's why they labeled our ancestors who were fighting for freedom and liberation and still to this day are labeling those of us who are fighting for freedom and liberation as somehow mentally ill, et cetera, et cetera, um, and not identifying their systems and structures of violence and oppression as a cause of our disabilities um, and deprivation, as a cause of our disabilities in many cases for indigenous and black folks um, and indigenous black folks. Um, so we have to name where that comes from. Um, the problem again is white supremacy, even within disability communities, all of our disability communities have this problem. Um, and that's important to name. And the second and related part of that is for so long, anti-Black disability labels have been placed upon Indigenous Black folks. Um, and so there is a resistance because it is often not safe for Black and Indigenous folks to actually identify as disabled. Um, and certainly we know that we have so many barriers already thrust upon us by the society we live in, that there are these other layers of complexity to it. So I really struggle with people who, um, not Teddy, but generally what happens is, um, and I'm speaking because I just received this, questions from white news media asking about accessibility of Black Indigenous uh, protests, for example, Black Lives Matter, uh, when they themselves aren't doing the work that they need to do. Um, so we're actually in conversation with our communities about ableism within our own communities, and we're going to keep doing that work. And in the interim, we need white people to work on their own communities and ableism and white supremacy in their own communities um, while we do our work internally as well. So that's what I want to say, and that's where I'll end. Yeah, this is Dustin. Um, I think there's like very tangible ways to, you know, ground some of the movements in disability justice. One is like thinking about moving from uh, uh, disability rights based framework of accessibility to a uh, access centered practice that disability justice calls upon us to do. Um, so when we think about uh, the rights-based framework, um, it individualizes um, our needs and the accommodations um, to meet those needs. Um, but what we know about access is uh, it benefits all of us and it's a collective process and an action. So in, in reality, it's a way of living and a way of life, right? Like, so even in this space right now, when we take breaks, the breaks are not only for interpreters, the breaks are for all of us to process, the breaks are for us to use the bathroom or to lay down or to get up and walk around. Um, so to do all of the things that we need to do to actually be comfortable. Um, so that's a part of it. And there, there's a myriad ways that we can uh, practice access in that way. One is to simply say, if somebody's left behind, then we're not going to do it, right? Um, and we're gonna find another way to do it. Um, I'm also thinking about what TL just mentioned um, as far as uh, Black and Indigenous people having very valid reasons not to identify as being disabled. Um, 
And there's a long history that we don't have time to go into for those reasons, but I do want to just note that they are very valid um, and the fear is very real because the consequences of being disabled has always been being institutionalized, being murdered and having your murder justified um, because of your disabilities um, and a myriad of other things. But I wanna acknowledge the fact that black people have not used the Western language of disability to talk about disability, but we have always talked about disability. Um, this is highlighted even through hip hop. You can listen to Lil Boosie songs. You can listen to Tupac songs. You can listen to no name songs. And you can see the presence of disability being discussed without actually using the terminology. And as it translates to the work that people do, I think of folks like Mumia Abu Jamal, who's a political prisoner um, and former Panther in uh, Pennsylvania right now, who has been in solitary for decades. Um, people fought for him to get hep C treatment. And in turn, when he got hep C treatment, all the Pennsylvania prisoners got hep C treatment. So understanding that disability is like one of the entry points into our movement helped literally save lives. I think right now about Russell Schultz, um, S-H-O-A-T-Z, who was also a political prisoner, a former Black Liberation um, Army member, who is experiencing a bunch of different health conditions right now. So when people are fighting for access to health care for Russell, they are operating from a disability justice praxis, but just not naming it as such. Um, and we see this across our movement. So one of the ways is to develop language, our own language, and identify how we already talk about it. Um, and I don't necessarily think that needs to be in the same way that white people talk about it, because the way that disabilities live in our body minds as Black and Indigenous people um, is completely different um, and for different reasons than what white people and particularly white elite people um, experience. This is TL, I'll just add one more thing to that is that our ancestors, Indigenous Black, um, have been fighting quite literally for disability justice time and memoriam. Um, one example of something that I can give that's concrete is a universal access to uh, meaningful health care. That's something that Black folks have been fighting for since a very, I mean, quite literally since the 1800s, since um, emancipation. Um, and in fact, the reason we do have the limited um, social health cares that we do have are quite literally due to Black people's struggle. If you look at Black Panthers in their 10-point program, a lot of what they were doing there was, in fact, disability justice, uh, providing uh, various uh, health and human needs. Um, those are acts of, of disability justice. So um, most of the labor that we, we find ourselves in, whether that be for um, clean water, clean houses, clean house, uh, safe housing, et cetera, um, freedom from deprivation of education, um, access to various things that are necessary to live and thrive. Those are in fact um, disability justice practices and praxis. And what I have to name is that marginalized people disproportionately experience disability. So while often in mainstream conversations about disability or mainstream pop culture, what you see is uh, white people being represented as disabled folks, um, what Teddy does is actually bring to the forefront the fact that black, brown, low income, incarcerated folks are disproportionately those who are disabled, um, even if we don't use that formalized language. And I dropped in the chat our disability solidarity playlist for people who are interested and seeing some black music um, that quite literally refers to disability, but doesn't name, few of the songs name disability, the vast majority don't, but they are in fact talking about disability. Absolutely, and I wanna to add to TL's comment as well. When you talk about the media, and everything, I feel like often there's not a lot of representation, not nearly enough representation when we look at how disability is displayed. There's, there's not enough representation for us to even have a conversation to discuss these difficult topics. And for many years, time in memoriam, like you said, there's just been 
only recently this kind of surge of looking at our history and how disability has played a role in it and looking at those who have been excluded. And me, as a deaf person coming from a deaf family, you know, my father, my grandfather, they were a deaf black gentleman as well. And they always preached to me, you know, the first thing people will see, even though you're deaf, is that you're black. That's going to be the first thing. So even though I have these challenges from being deaf in my day-to-day -day life, I can speak and I can speak well, as they say, and I can lip read. But even with that, it, it kind of forces me to have to accommodate to other people to survive for my own life. And often when we look at disability and people often have to fight to prove that they're even disabled for people to care and, and take up the mantle and fight for them as well. So that kind of lack of visib visibility when we talk about not having, um, not being provided enough access and not having the representation, all of that needs to change because we, it's been the same stories time and time again through the generations, our ancestors experienced it. And only now is the media kind of catching up with the day-to-day -day struggles that we experience in the disability community. So, you know, a lot of my work even looks at that and really showing how black indigenous people, we are here. We are a part of society. We're a part of the community and uh, we need more of that. And that's what I use my uh, platform for my videography work. Hello everyone, this is Aisha, um, I am back. And we're gonna move on to the next question, which I will also put into the chat, which is, where does ableism show up where you least expect it? Yeah. I mean, it's piggybacking off my recent comments when we talk about ableism, you know, who are we thinking about when we think about people with disabilities? Am I the first person that comes into mind when you think of a disabled person? Is it a black deaf person, a person who signs, you know? And I think you have to realize how you're unable to, com unable to communicate with me and then dismissing that fact and, you know, not figuring out a way to, to work that out, whether that be writing, what have you, that happens all the time. So there are these kind of misunderstandings and that occur and there needs to be a dialogue that needs to happen about accommodation and who is supposed to meet who where, as opposed to the person with a disability always having to provide their own accommodations. So, when we talk about access and needing to constantly, you know, reach out to people and say, hey, can we develop some kind of ramp to get into the building? Because people who use wheelchairs are unable to access your building. That kind of thing needs to be planned on the front end of projects. It, does, it shouldn't get to the point where people don't have a ramp and now they're asking for it. The, this lack of access has been something that's just a part of our, nation's you know landscape and we continue to fight the systems and we're pointing to specific experiences personal experiences about why we're fighting for the recognition of just our day-to-day -day challenges when it comes to access so when we're fighting ableism i mean it it, it shows up it shows up everywhere and i think how we fight it, it looks like education having more open and honest conversations and really changing our perspective and the lens of which we're viewing uh, disability and, and how it shows up in our own personal lives and, and how we look at accommodations. This is Tia, I'll add to that because I completely agree. I, I think now's a good time to pin the fact that there's a distinction between disability rights and disability justice. Um, one clear example of how dis, uh, ableism shows up is the framing, how the ADA frames accommodations, for example. So there are people on this call who, for example, are hearing and don't know sign language. And often what hearing people who don't know sign language say about um, interpreters is that, oh, the interpreter is for that one person who uses sign language or for that one deaf person, when really everyone is literally relying on the interpreter. Right now, I'm relying on the interpreter to convey my message. 
right? And so the framing of the ADA, and this goes back to the very white supremacist kind of um, structuring of disability rights, is that the individual becomes the the person who needs an accommodation as opposed to all of us in society being interdependent, which is what disability justice says, that we're all interdependent and that the interpreter is helping all of us survive because we need the information from everybody. And if that information isn't flowing, some of us might die, right, in a very literal sense. Um, and so I think it's important to really name and frame for you all that there are these really important distinctions and that disability justice was developed by um, Black, Indigenous, queer folks, by the, for the most part, who noticed that the Americans with Disabilities Act wasn't reaching the vast majority of Black, Indigenous, low-income, incarcerated people because of the requirements that are built into the structures of our United States laws. And so if you can't meet the prerequisites for counting as disabled, for having evidence of your disabilities, i.e. if you don't have insurance, i.e. if you're actually disabled because of racial uh, oppression, because of economic oppression, because of institutional oppression, you don't get evidence from that for, from a doctor. <laughs> when was the last time you saw somebody with evidence of uh, you know, perpetual racism-based stress from a doctor, right? Like those things don't happen. And those who are experiencing those traumas and those deprivations often don't have the resources necessary to prove that they're actually in fact experiencing these things. In fact, we need evidence of the evidence of our evidence, right? Um, and so these are the problems inherent in just following the law. You end up with these check marks for access as opposed to a, a broad understanding of what justice like human accommodations look like. I recently wrote a piece, um, it's, it's the last piece I wrote on my blog about um, perpetual racism-based stress. If you look at the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, whatever edition we're on at this point, there's myriad disabilities that have been created by and large by the pharmaceutical complex and the medical industrial complex about alleged disabilities that people may or may not have. Um, in the instance of um, police violence, for example, you won't find in the DSM something about um, perpetual anxiety or phobias around law enforcement. Although if you walk up to any black person or if you're in a black family, what we know is that we have inherent feelings around law enforcement, right? But that is not institutionalized in any of these books that are created and written by and for um, wealth privileged and white privileged people. Um, and that's just a clear example of, of, of ableism and how it is inherently anti-black. Right, because the people who have developed these concepts around what is and is not disability, what should and should not be accommodated, by and large, don't belong to indigenous black communities. And even if we do, we don't have sufficient power or authority to convince people of how traumatic our lived experiences are as a result of generations of violence, deprivation, and trauma. So I hope that makes sense. And I encourage you all to take a look at that piece try to expand on some of those concepts. Yeah, this is Dustin. So as, as Theo was uh, mentioning, and Teddy as well, about um, who is viewed as disabled and not, I do want to talk about like this in like a global perspective of thinking about all colonized people as the colonizers uh, deciding who is disabled or who is not disabled. Um, I'm thinking specifically about protests in 2016 in Bolivia, um, it was actually like a really dope direct action where uh, people suspended themselves from bridges uh, and wheelchairs. Um, and what they were protesting for was 500 Bolivianos per month as a disability benefit, which translates to about $72 uh, US currency. Um, so in Bolivianos, that's not enough for return bus fare home per day. So to think about the amount of scraps people are getting, one, is under the guise of disability benefits, all of the caps that we have, that we can't work, that we can't earn enough money. So it is like creating perpetual poverty, which is violence, right? And what we know is poverty uh, also uh, uh, leads to, to, to violence in a different form. And it also leads to trauma in a different form. And all of those are con 
causes and consequences of each other. Um, so these ableist structures that we're under, right? Um, thinking about the use of solitary confinement, um, solitary and psych wards, which is not called solitary, it's just called like isolation. Um, in kid jails, it's called uh, uh, exclusionary time. Um, in prisons, it's called solitary, sometimes restrictive housing. We have all of these different names to talk about how we're isolating people. In Turkey, they're doing the same thing to women in prison, right? And political prisoners in Turkey and people have been resisting that for a long time. Um, Kurdish women have been. Um, so this is a global effort to stop the development of creating new disabilities. So I'm thinking about Palestine as a place that has so many people that are now using prosthetic limbs that they don't have enough to actually keep up with the amount of people that um, are having amputees. Uh, having legs and arms amputated. Um, so we wouldn't view these populations in general as people that are overwhelmingly disabled. In the U.S. context, we talk about places like the South Bronx as having very low air quality. And because of that, like 75 to 85 percent of the young people have asthma. But we're not counting those people as being disabled. We talk about places like Compton or North Philly or East St. Louis is places where people are experiencing complex post-traumatic stress disorder, meaning that they're still in it at rates that are like super high, right? Well above the majority, but we're not viewing those people as disabled. In a Pittsburgh context, and I'm, and I'm referencing Pittsburgh because a lot of my work lives there, there's a neighborhood that on average, each person in this 3,000 person neighborhood is on four prescription medications. But what the census tells us is only 25% of those people are disabled. So as Teddy and both TL said, um, who we're counting as disabled and why is, is one of the ways in which ableism is like right in front of us. Another way it's right in front of us in the policing context is all of the blanket bullshit charges that the police give out to people are rooted in ableism. When we think about excited delirium, which is a condition created in which they said Natasha McKenna was experiencing when they had to murder her with 12 people with their legs and, and hands uh, shackled, that is also something that people, the children are being diagnosed with, right? And other people in communities are. Um, when we think about disorderly conduct, no lawyer, no judge, no a cop, no one can explain to you what disorderly conduct is. Um, it's a blanket charge used to encapsulate a bunch of people and the majority of those people being black and disabled. And also the list goes on, resisting arrest. Um, we often see that in, in interactions with police and anybody that is a, a, attempting to, to uh, restore some type of agency or autonomy, um, whether they're committing a purported crime or not. Um, but those are some of the ways in which ableism is literally right in front of us all the time, but we're not naming it as such, and it's embedded into our system. This is Aisha again. Um, I want to take a moment and just thank everyone who has been sh who has been sharing on this. I think just working with all of you, we have learned so much, and we are grateful, and we commit to do better as well. I want to shift the conversation to a local disability justice activist who has been personally affected by police violence, uh, Baxter Jones. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and share your story. Hello, everyone. My name is Baba Baxter Jones. I'm, uh, I present as a black man, disabled, uh, wheelchair user. I identify with traumatic brain injury, paralysis, um, and um, chronic PTSD, among other disabilities. So I have multi-disabilities. Um, I was in an auto accident. I wasn't born with my disabilities. So I had to make uh, adjustments 
in the way that I viewed not only my life, but just life. Um, in 2014, I was participating in a nonviolent protest because people in my city, which is 80% predominantly black city that I live in, in Detroit, were getting their water shut off. It was an attack on our community, and I felt compelled that I had to do something to demonstrate my displeasure with what was going on. So I was in this protest. I was arrested by police, um, and the violence that was um, done to me is not the type of violence that can easily be recognized because I wasn't shot, I wasn't beaten, but I was subjected to a violent manner of arrest, which nearly ended up um, and could have ended up breaking my neck. So I had ended up with severe damage to um, my neck, which causes me um, to now have to use a power wheelchair. Before the arrest, I was able to use a push wheelchair. And there's a lot more liberation and freedom, at least from my perspective, in using that kind of wheelchair. And being able to do the things that I could do then and cannot do now. So that's been taken away from me. Um, in 2017, we filed a lawsuit uh, to push back against this violence and what had occurred to me. And um, in that lawsuit, not only did we name the injuries that occurred to me, but we named the systemic causes of why this happened, namely that the city of Detroit and the police department um, are not and have not been compliant with disability law. So they did not have any really accessible vehicles in which to put a person like me in when transporting to jail or prison. Um, they did, however, have one safe method that was in their playbook, is what I'll say, their, their police ordinance book, where they could have called paramedics, but they chose not to do that. Unfortunately, at this time, we just heard this morning that my lawsuit, which had been appealed and was in the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, that they, re they made a split decision among the judges, which seems very partisan political decision, to dismiss my case. That means, in fact, that police were able to use a defense called qualified immunity. And you're going to hear a lot about that if you haven't already. It is a law that shields police from accountability for their actions. In my case, um, I was arrested. I was charged by police with um, disorderly conduct and um, disturbing the peace. However, uh, and I was arrested with eight other people, so there were nine of us. Out of the nine, the prosecutor decided not to charge me. So I wasn't even charged by the prosecutor. I was arrested and injured for the rest of my life. So there's no accountability. None whatsoever, because I was in a, I was exercising my First Amendment rights. Um, in closing, 
I would just like to say to, and, and thank you for all the participants in this um, panel. This is very important and we have to have more of these kinds of discussions. Thank you, TL. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Teddy, um, for shedding light on an enormous issue. And, and I think that social workers, um, um, what we're asking you and what I'm asking you, because you have powerful positions within this system um, to create change. We need justice. Um, what does that look like? It does not look like what we're receiving now. It does not look like law and order. It does not look like police using qualified immunity to excuse bad behavior. And so I'm asking you to get in touch with Aisha and find out how you can use your resources and your power. We need things like petitions to go across the country to get the word out that a disabled man, black man, was arrested, not charged, and injured for the rest of his life because he was in a protest against a city, a powerful city, turning off people's water. And that's basically what I have to say in the time that is allotted. I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak. Hello, everyone. This is Aisha. Thank you, Baba, for sharing your story. And if you want to help Baba in this cause or learn more, we've added some links in the chat as well as Baba's email address, and we'll also be sharing uh, my email address as well. I would like to ask before we move on to question and answer, any closing thoughts from our panelists? This is TL to clarify. I thought you said we were gonna do Q and A or you're asking for closing thoughts, which one? I might've missed that. This is Aisha. I was just asking if the panelists have any closing thoughts and then we can move to Q&A. This is TL. I just want to take a moment to honor uh, Baba Baxter, who is here today, um, who I met years and years ago, um, fighting for disability justice <laughs> back then. Um, and just to even be here in the midst of uh, such bad news this morning, I see your thumbs up. Thank you. It's just an honor to be in your presence. And we continue to learn from Black disabled elders they are a wealth and fount of knowledge. Um, I know that Dustin and myself both have some really um, important elders. Milton is one of Dustin's Black disabled elder. Um, John Wilson is one of my Black disabled elders. We have dozens of them. Um, and if we don't consider them to be a place where we can go to to sit at their um, chair <laughs> wheels and learn or their at the end of their canes and learn, then we're really missing out on a lot of good information. Teddy already mentioned his father, his father's father. Um, we really need to be looking to our elders for knowledge as well. And we need to be in an intergenerational struggle for justice because we won't be able to achieve if we forget what has been done, what errors were made, um, what, what land was gained, um, what rights or justice was gained. Um, from them. So I just really want to take a moment to honor you, Baba, and uh, let you know that we love and cherish you. Yeah. This is Dustin, um, and I want to echo some of the sentiments that T.O. Uh, mentioned, especially about Baba and, and elders as a part of our movement um, in ways that uh, we can honor them by, by fighting for justice, um, not simply fighting for uh, accommodations to be taken to jails and prisons. Um, but Bob mentioned the reason that was the protest was ensuing because people's water was being cut off, right? Um, so when I'm thinking about abolition, I'm not just thinking about the destructions of 
physical jails and prisons and the removal of police. I'm thinking about the presence of all of the things that we need to be well, including water is one of them, right? Um, so one of the ways in which I think we can fight for people is one, like really just showing up. There, there's a lot of ways, and I'm sure Baba has a, a lot of recommendations on how we could show up um, for him and other people. Um, but then the other is to uh, really uh, collectively imagine what a world looks like without police and prisons and jails and institutions, um, because these things are not permanent. And we actually like don't have to live in a world with them. Um, and as Bob mentioned, there's not justice within that legal system. Um, and that court will never grant justice. But one thing they can do is grant reparations um, to um, people that have survived harms. Um, so that's one area that we could fight for is, is, is totally the reparations for people that have been, um, uh, uh, had violence inflicted upon them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And both TL, Dustin, your words, I echo those sentiments. We absolutely have to honor the generations that come before us, the, will, the wisdom of our elders, you know, I can't say it enough. We have to continue to educate and have these, these discussions like we're having today because we can't learn if we're not, um, I also wanna mention that we can't learn if we're not willing to be open and engage with others to talk about these things. How we provide support in our spaces for many, many years, black and indigenous communities have suffered oppression and they've needed the support. A lot of the times when we, often when we think about what we are able to do and what we're able to give, how we're able to support um, to, to support these oppressed communities. And myself as a deaf black man, my community and, and how it struggles, how it fights to work with others uh, is difficult. And I recognize a lot of what Baba's story, you know, echoes within my own life and experiences as a deaf black man. So I, I also met ba uh, Baba a few years ago and he was shared a lot of his wisdom with me, shared the, the fight that he had been on. And, you know, it really touches me uh, to hear his words today. Um, I'm sorrowful of how the case ended up, but it, it does remind me of how we need to continue to um, recognize all disabilities, not just the deaf community, but all communities. And we need to give back where we can, because just like it was mentioned on this call, release brutality happens all of the time. And justice is not just gonna be given. You know, the next thing to say, oh, you know, we did you wrong and, and here's some justice. We have to fight for it and we have to fight um, continuously until we get what we deserve and what is rightfully owed to us. You know, the experiences of abuse that we've had um, it's going to, to inform our future generations. You know, we are going to be the future elders and the work that we do in making sure that the spaces of oppressed people are supported is, is going to aid in their continuous fight. So I just want to thank Baba for, for the work that you've been doing uh, when it comes to abolition and uh, the oppressive police state and, and all of that. I've got so much more to learn from you as well as UTL and Dustin as well. I've learned a lot from you two uh, as well, you know, just as a deaf person and, and recognizing that we have so many, there's so much, so many layers to this. You know, when we talk about dis the disabled community, there, there's so many layers. So I've learned a lot from you all and I thank you for that. This is Aisha, I wanna thank you all. Uh, we're gonna open it up to some question and answers. I know we only have a few minutes. We have a question from Elliot Carter. And I'm going to go ahead and just read it out. Thank you so much, Baba. Absolutely heartbreaking that we learned about the fate of your case just this morning. We appreciate you being here in this difficult time. My question is for TL. I recall you saying something about shelters being a part of the prison industrial complex. Can you say more about that? This is something that is not covered in my social work curricula. Hey, this is TL, I appreciate that question. Um, 
I, I won't be able to cover it all in this short time, so I'll refer you to some places where you can go to get the historical grounding and understanding about the connections. And then I'll touch on some examples of the current connections. So really quickly, if you look at the history of um, post-emancipation, um, deprivation of economic and other resources for Black people who were newly legally freed, um, and then the label placed upon uh, disabled folks, um, disabled, some many were disabled, um, and Black folks who couldn't support themselves due to quite literally hundreds of years of free labor that didn't inure to their benefit. Dustin, can you drop the article I wrote about manumission and truthout.com? Um, so then I also encourage you to take a look and so look at who was labeled dependent and what that then, um, what that led to in terms of consequences for those people who were labeled dependent under the US structure. The second place is to look at alms houses, which is the old word for shelters, um, where people who um, uh, were lower no income, especially uh, women and black people and indigenous folks were placed um, and what happened in those spaces and what those spaces looked like. Also look at the history of who was held in so-called asylums. You not only found um, folks who were labeled disabled, you found folks who escaped enslavement, you found folks who were driven mad by forced familial separation, black folks. Uh, you found women who were labeled promiscuous. Uh, you found women who had been survivors of sexual violence. You found trans and gender queer folks. You found elderly folks who were gender queer, and you also found orphans and other low and no come no income people, also people who uh, were addicted to various things, including gambling, etc. So when you actually look at the history who was held in both alms houses, asylums, and prisons, and also zoos, which is what I talked about a little bit earlier, they all actually tend to be the same group of people. Fast forward to today. What we know is that a lot of the folks who are criminalized due to alleged dependency, um, so folks begging on the street, soliciting, soliciting, loitering, uh, and there's a bunch of other terms that have been created um, to quite literally criminalize people who are deemed dependent. Um, all of those things are found then in the nexus of systems that capture people who are low or no income today. There's a lot of private businesses that are involved in a lot of the shelters that of course make benefit. Um, and then if you look at a lot of the murders by police, they happen in shelters because police have been called on people who are experiencing what should be let's provide for their needs and instead is let's call the police and, you know, get these people out of this space. Um, so there's a lot more I could say. I don't have enough time, but maybe if Teddy or, or Dustin wanted to add anything, you can. I see Elliot said thank you in the chat. So maybe that was sufficient for you to go do your homework. We have about one more minute left. This is Aisha. We have about one more minute left and I want to be respectful of people's time. So we are going to, unless Teddy or Dustin, you have anything else that you would like to add? We just have a few reminders for next week that we're going to cover. We want to thank you all for being on. This was a very informative session and I think we've all learned a lot. So we're grateful. And Baba um, has, you, I've seen that you sent me some messages about information you'd like me to share, which I can share out with participants after the call. So as a reminder, um, we as a team have put together a list of volunteer opportunities, which you can access at this link. If you have been volunteering in the community for field credit, make sure to fill out the form to document it and to receive uh, permission from your field faculty advisor. To see our archive discussions by Engage, go to this link. And as an FYI, tomorrow we do have our debrief session on criminal justice reform. And we wanna really discuss what, have, what we've learned from these calls and what we can do collectively as a school. So one of my team members will be dropping this RSVP link into the chat, that's tomorrow at 12.30. Hey, this is Dustin. Could I say just like one brief thing? Please, before? yeah, please. So one of the things, uh, I, yeah, that I've learned from elders is that uh, typically we think about 
how we approach these, uh, uh, how we approach like fights for justice is by just like learning all of these things. Um, and the, the best way that we learn is like actually by doing. And that does not require us to have these large mass critical formations of people um, that small groups of people can actually move shit forward and get things popping. Um, so if you have three or four or five people and y'all are committed and you meet weekly and you do all of the meetings that all of it requires, um, you could actually push the needle forward. And we need so much more of that, right? When we're calling for abolition and we're saying that we need to defund the police as a means to abolish them, that it requires us to be actively working on those where we're at. Like I've seen like, uh, 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 University of California, San Francisco, start to call for the removal of police from their entire hospital. Um, and that's going to require, like, there's not one solution to it. They need to have a bunch of different, not alternatives, but a, def a bunch of different things, right? So in this moment, it feels very important that we are making and we are doing things and we are trying and failing. The police and prisons and jails have had over hundreds of years and generations and resources to do all of the things and they have still failed to actually provide safety um, for all of us, right? So for us, as people that are worried about justice and concerned about it, uh, we just need to do more of the actual acting. Um, I view conversations as a part of that, but then there's also like the, the tangible, what are we doing to build in our communities? Um, so I want to welcome people into the movement, if you're not already in it, by just getting together with a few people and trying and failing things. Um, we're limited in resources um, as opposed to the state. So the one way that we can combat that is with people and with models that people build. This is Aisha, everyone. I want to thank you again, Dustin, Baba Baxter, Teddy, TL. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with all of us. If you could also provide your contact information to us, we can send it out to the students and others on this call. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we will be sending the resources and materials that were shared during this call out to our participants. Thank you again.